let's slowly begin. I hope that some people will join us in the next couple of minutes. But uh, so today is the last lecture of our online school. I really hope that everyone enjoyed it, both uh, speakers and uh, the audience. Uh, so you can find uh, all the lectures uh, on YouTube. It will be available. Uh, yeah, it is already available on uh, our laboratory channel. So we'll also update uh, the web page of the school uh, to get all the materials there and trying to put all the slides over there. Well, and uh, so today is the last lecture by Torfin Corneliusen from University of Copenhagen. So Torfin, please. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> so maybe things was moving a bit too, uh, too fast the last time and maybe it was not really the, uh, the scope of, uh, of the course talking about the the mathematical details of uh, of the EM algorithm. So today it's going to be a bit more by, uh, ba back to biology and how this applies to NGS data. I'll talk about the side frequency spectrum that uh, Rasmus defined uh, some months back. I'll talk about how, to, how we, we infer this in the context of uh, low coverage data. And then uh, I'll also talk about uh, admixture, which is uh, is one of these uh, summary statistics that uh, people are always very interested in in, um, in looking at because it shows you which part of or the proportion of your genome that belongs to different ancestries. So, so this is normally even for people that are not geneticists, this is something that's a, a concept that's relatively easy to to grasp. So. Uh, and then there will also be a, an exercise. There hasn't been um, much exercises in, in what I've been doing. It's a bit difficult to to set up these uh, things when it's not a proper class. But here for, for the NGS mix analysis that you'll be doing, there's uh, actually a full tutorial online. So I, I've put the, the two slides for SF, for the SFS and the admixture together with the um, with the uh, with a link, it's the one called popgen.dk uh, NGS admix tutorial. So this will you'll spend uh, I think fifteen or maybe twenty minutes downloading this software and then run it on some uh, test data set and, and look at the results. And then I'll go I'll do exactly the same afterwards where I go through the exercise. But I'll um. So let's start with the SFS part here. I'll share it now. Good. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. And you can also see the mouse when I move it around. Yes. Good. Okay. So, so the frequency spectrum and uh, disturbingly, uh, the figure that you're seeing below the title is not a frequency spectrum. This is actually an ad, ad mixture plot. So, so forget about this uh, image for now. We'll, I'll talk about this. It's here because I wanted to do like one joint presentation, but then I decided to split it up into different PDFs. So forget about this picture for now. So um, this is, uh, I'll talk about what the speed, what the frequency spectrum is. I'll show how this is, uh, why this is a very, very relevant thing to do. And then uh, finally, how to, to do this for, uh, for high throughput sequencing data with all the problems that exist with the uh, high throughput sequencing data. Okay, so uh, so to begin with, um, 
we, we, we have uh, genomes for, uh, we, we have a full population that could be the entire human population. Then we are choosing a, a subsample of this that could be 10 individuals or maybe just three individuals or, or, or just something a much smaller value than the full population. This is our sample. And then for, for each individual, then we figure out what the, what, what the genotype is. And, and the genotype is the, is the combination of alleles for, for a single individual, okay? So if you have three individuals in a diploid organism, then you have uh, six different observed uh, alleles, right? So if you're working with, with standard um, a single snip variation and not insertions and deletions, then uh, then the, the alleles you observe are, are just the basis for, from the alphabet A, C, G, and T. Okay, so this is what you, so for each individual, you observe two, uh, two bases. That could be AA or AC or AG or, or any of this combination. And, and we have 10 different uh, possible uh, genotypes. Okay, so what the side frequency spectrum is, is that instead of looking at, at the genotype for each individual, then we'll look at what the allele is that we have overall for a specific position. And then we simply count how many do we have of, uh, of one of the types. So assuming that um, a site is, um, for a single site that you can only observe two different alleles, it can be any combination from A, C, D, or T, but you can only observe two. This is what we call that the site is, uh, is dialectic. If, if we assume that is the case, then we can just count uh, how many times do we observe uh, one of them. We can go to the next position and count how many times do we observe uh, uh, one of them. And, and we can do this for each position. But what, what we normally do is that we, we, we don't really, we, we want to, know which exact one that we're looking at. This is what we call, we can, we can polarize what, what we are really counting. And the tradition is that we are normally counting the, uh, the minor allele. And, and by the minor, that means that it's, it's the second most frequently occurring uh, allele. Okay, so in this case, if you can see my mouse, we, this is uh, the genotypes for individual one the TT genotype. This is the, uh, the genotype for the second individual, AA genotype, the same with the third individual. So we observe two different alleles. The two different alleles we are observing are, are A and T, okay? So the, the most frequently occurring allele is an A. The second most uh, frequently occurring, that, that's the T. So we count how many times we observe a T. Okay, this is for the first position, right? So we are calculating for each side, we are calculating the, the frequency or so, so in this case, it's the absolute frequencies of the, of the second most frequently occurring or the, the minor allele. We go to the next uh, position on the, on the genome. We are observing uh, how many do we have? We have two, three, four, five C's and one G's. Okay, so the major allele for this side is a C and the minor allele is a G. And how many times do we observe the G? That's one. Okay, we go to the third position. Now we observe four Gs and two Cs. Okay, so in this case here, we are, uh, the major allele is a G and the minor allele is a T and we observe two of those. So just in case that you have forgotten, if, if you have the, the two alleles are, are the same within an individual, no matter what type it is, if it's the same, we say that it's a homozygous. If it's different, we call it, it a heterozygous. So when we are counting the, um, these uh, minor alleles for, uh, for each side, we cannot really distinguish if, it's, uh, if we have a value of two if you observe two minor, if that's because we observed one homozygous for the uh, for the minor, or if we if or if there had been a two heterozygotes, okay, we, we cannot distinguish between this. So this is a, 
Uh, for each side, it's a projection down into the number of, uh, of minor alleles we have. And we, of course, uh, lose some information when we do this. Okay, but this is not the frequency spectrum. This is just counting how many times we observe uh, minor alleles. So what we do now is that we take at all these per site counts that, that we have. And then now we count how many times did we observe one minor allele so we observed one minor allele one, two, three, four times, right? We write down four. How many times did we observe a, a two? Two minor alleles, one, two, three, four, five times. So we write that down. And then we, we can make these nice uh, bar plots. And then the, I'm not sure how much uh, Rasmus talked about this, but the, but the expectation from a side frequency spectrum in a in a neutral model with that when there's no selection and no demography and uh, no population splits and no population size changes is that the frequency spectrum will be proportional to a, a one over a x curve so if the if the first uh, if you observe 10 sites uh, Single, right, so we call this the singleton category and the doubleton category, right? The singleton category is the is the is the bin where we had one uh, derived allele. So, but we would expect that the doubleton category would be half the size of your um, half your size of your singleton category. Okay, so so this is how we we. Uh, we, we define and, and calculate the, the site frequency uh, spectrum on, on the basis of uh, observed uh, genotypes, okay? And this is a, a concept which is always extremely confusing to, to people. And I think it's because it's like a, it's a frequency of frequencies. It's, um, it's, uh, it, it's always difficult at exams uh, with, with, pe with people that are, in Poppy, and I always ask them to define the frequency spectrum, and they always uh, end up with some convoluted uh, definition, which is not really correct. <laughs> so it's um, it's even though they know what it is, even though they worked with it for uh, for months, so it's uh, it's it's not it's not easy to define. So it's the it's a it, frequencies of the frequencies. So depending on context, when you calculate these frequencies, you either keep it in a as uh, relative frequencies, as probabilities, or in the, or expected values like the number of sites where we have uh, singleton and doubleton. So it's a it's a bit dependent on the context. So this is when we define the frequency spectrum according to the minor. We can also do it uh, more general, which is actually the the better approach. But, but this is might might not always be uh, possible. And this is instead of saying that we are counting the number of second most frequently observing uh, alleles or bases, then we, we kind of have an, a label of what, the, uh, of what the ancestral allele was in the, in the species that we are interested in, um, in, in working with. So this is the ancestral information for, for humans. The ancestral state would be uh, would be to look at what my, at, at the, what the chimp might be, right? Because we, we seven millions ago we diverged from, from the chimp, so whatever base that um, that the chimp has is a likely represent for what our um, what the ancestral state had been. In reality, when you are trying to uh, to, to to find this uh, out group or ancestral state, it's it's not easy because there's been evolution going on down two branches, right? So, so what people do in practice is that they look at not just the chimp, but also at the macaque and, and, and the bonobo. And then they look at what the consensus is within that, uh, within these, uh, within these uh, apes or monkeys. I'm not sure what, what, what the difference is be between those uh, phrases. So if, if we have the, uh, the ancestral allele, then we can count how many Non ancestral do we observed? How many derived, right? So we, are, we can either work in a context of major and minor, or we can work in a context of, um, of ancestral or derived. 
If you're working with the VCF file, then, then they put another layer on top of this. Then they're suddenly working with, with reference uh, and al alternative alleles. Okay, but for the for side frequency spectrum, the um, the obvious choice to uh, to work with here is um, is the ancestor and derived if it's possible to 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 obtain these. Okay, so now we are not counting the number of um, of uh, of of minus, but the number of non outgroup alleles. So for this first case here, we are observing two non A's. In the second position, we're observing one non C. And let's see if that's an interesting example here. No, because what would have been useful in this example would have been if there was one site where we would actually observe um, three different alleles. Because if we define it as uh, the, the number of non ancestral alleles, then you just count the number of. Uh, of the non ancestrals and then we don't really need to worry about these uh, if it's uh, triallelic okay so we can do exactly the same here and if we do this count the number of uh, non ancestral all the way then we can also if we look at the final position we have an outgroup which is um which is a g this is our ancestral and we observe one two three four five non ancestrals okay so this side frequency spectrum looks very different from the first one we had. It, here we have mo much fewer categories. And this is because we, here we are actually, if we are looking at the, um, at the minor, then we are doing some kind of folding of the data. Okay, so, so we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are binning categories that we don't need to do if we work with the polarized. Because if you have, if you are, if you have six alleles, okay, then then your side frequency spectrum is the uh, is the distribution that defines how many times do we observe a zero derived allele, one derived allele, two derived allele, three derived, all the way up to six derived alleles, okay. So excuse me. Yes. So am I right that uh, the label on the x-axis here is incorrect? Uh, yes, that is incorrect. Correct. You're very right about that. It should have been the number of um, derived alleles here. Good. Thank okay. you. I'll, I'll make sure to update this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I could see that this uh, might have been uh, confusing. So what we are counting here is not the number of minor alleles, but the number of derived alleles. Okay, and here we observe that um, we have one, two, three, four, five different categories. In, in reality, when we have a side frequency spectrum for, for three individuals, then you would expect to have seven categories because you also have the possibility of having, of observing non-derived alleles. So it, if this example were, should have been better, I think there should be, have been like two extra columns, one, where we only observed uh, uh, ancestral alleles. So that would have been like the, the zero ton category. This is where you only observe ancestral uh, alleles. This would be the large, large proportion of, of, of the genome. Okay, because all the other positions that we have are the variable positions, but, but the biggest part of the human genome are, are non-variable. So there should be, have been like a sink as an example here where we had observed only ancestral alleles. And there should actually also have been an example where we had observed um, only derived alleles. Because if you had looked, if you had plotted the, uh, the side frequency spectrum, then the category where we observe only ancestral alleles is the first one. And if you look at the category where you're observing only derived, that would have been the, the last one. So it would have been the first and the last one for the only ancestral and the only derived. And this is, um, so what we are actually calculating when we are doing the, the minor, the, the side frequency spectrum defined by the uh, minor allele frequency is actually 
the folded side frequency spectrum where we take the first category and then the, the, the second last category and put those together. So from the, from the, pole, from the side frequency spectrum that are polarized according to the uh, ancestral and derived, you can go back to the, uh, to the folded frequency spectrum, right? By binning these categories, but you cannot go, go the other way. Okay, so I think this was uh, a thorough uh, introduction to to the the side frequency uh, spectrum. Are there any questions about how this is calculated? We'll talk a lot about the interpretation uh, shortly, but are there any questions about how this is actually being calculated and what it represents? <clears throat> Okay, so, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, yeah, I think it covers, um, um, I, I'm not sure there'll be an example for, for, for this, but, but it might be, be useful to talk a bit about it now, because now we are looking at the side frequency spectrum for, for, for uh, one population, for, for one, sample from, uh, from, from one population. What we will do later on is to look at the two-dimensional side frequency spectrum, okay? And this is where we are, for each position on, on your genome, now we have two vectors to keep track of. Then we count how many times is, do we observe uh, derived allele in one population and how many times do we observe the, this uh, derived allele in the other population. So now for each position of genome, we now have two values, and then we can make a sort of a heat map of this. But 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 that's uh, maybe we, there will be an example of this. Otherwise, we, uh, you have uh, you know the definition now. Okay, so so the frequency spectrum I mentioned before that uh, the frequency spectrum should look like um, uh, one over x. So it, so for each time you go go one category down it should be um, proportion it should be proportional to uh, to a one over x curve but in reality with when we're working with real data this is never what we observe the, this is uh, it's transformed it's modified it, it doesn't look like what we expect but this just by the fact that it doesn't look like we, we expect, we can actually draw some conclusions about which kind of demography that has uh, shaped the population that we are analyzing. So here is a side frequency spectrum. Okay, so, um, so this is the singleton category of the side frequency spectrum. That would be the proportion. So here, when I say proportion of the genome, this is, it doesn't mean that 35% of a human genome is, uh, you have singleton variants. It means that for 35% of the variable positions of the variable part of, of, a, of the, the genome, that there you observe singletons. So the singleton category is, is, uh, is what, what defines most of the variations that we observe. We should have twice as many singleton variants that as, as doubleton variants in, in a population. So this is the proportion of the genome where we have one variant or, 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 or one derived allele. This is the proportion of genome where we have two derived alleles. So um, by theory, what we should have would be that uh, the, this, this doubleton should be half the size as the uh, as the as the singleton category, if we look at the um, at the African, which is the the dark red, um, then we can see that it's. Um, I think that follows roughly that this doubleton category is half the size as the singleton category. If we look at the European one, we are, that's the, the orange one, then the doubleton category is around 0 0.15, but the doubleton, no, the singleton category is, uh, 
is more than uh, 0.35. So, so the, the singleton category is is higher for the uh, for for European population. And um, uh, but, but I I can see that it's it's not large values that is causing the. So, so it might be difficult to argue that there is a difference. It might just be a, a estimation bias. But what is very, very clear here is that we have also included uh, the Greenlandish population in this analysis. Okay. And there we can see that the, the singleton category is absolutely not twice the size as the doubleton uh, category. Okay, this is what we would expect. So we can see here that there has been some kind of uh, of demographic event that has caused all these uh, uh, rare va variants. So this is what we call the singleton category. These are the variants in the population which is not that that is not uh, go, uh, that not so many people have. Well, it's the private variations. Okay. Yeah, so that's not that many in, in the Greenlandish populations, but but let's let's maybe that's an example of about wh why that is later on. Okay, so that's this should motivate the the, the demographic uh, part of the uh, of why the signals uh, or why the side frequency spectrum is uh, is interesting to to look at. One other thing which is also used uh, a lot with regards to uh, to the side frequency spectrum. It's used for doing a demography analysis. This is where you're calculating the, the full site frequency spectrum across the entire genome for a n number of individuals. But what it's also used for a lot, this is, uh, is for finding a selection. This is uh, what, what it's being used for. But what we are really doing when we are using these uh, side frequency spectrum is not that we are not really looking for selections. We are looking for uh, for, for for changes to, uh, to to the side frequency spectrum. This could be caused by other things that, than selection. So these are the a family of uh, of selection tests that is called uh, like the the, the frequency based. Uh, selection says that we have Tajima and, and many others. I think Tajima is the most famous and, and most uh, useful. Okay, so um, so let, let's talk about why the, um, the side frequency spectrum will be changed in the, in the presence of, uh, of, of selection. So look at this figure. There we have uh, some lines each line represents the, the genome of uh, an, uh, an individual. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight individuals. So we have, uh, and then we have some variants for each of these individuals. On the, for the first individual, the one on the top, we have three variants. On the second individual, we have one, two, three, four, five variants. We can also see that this variant we have here is shared between the first two uh, individuals. So we can, um, if we wanted to calculate the number of, uh, or build a side frequency spectrum from this, then we could look at the first variant. We only observe this once. We can look at the second variant. We only observe this once, the same with this one. And then we have this one, this we observed two times. So based on this figure, we could also build a side frequency spectrum. So this is uh, not an, an, an interesting uh, region because it's neutral, right? We, we have lots of variability everywhere. So this is uh, what it could look like. Then certainly uh, um, mutation enters the, uh, the, the, the population. This is marked as a, as a red dot here. It's very close to, a, to another variant we observe. Okay, so it's, it's not good to have this. So this uh, is removed completely. This is, it's not beneficial to have. It might not, it, it might cause uh, early childhood disease. So this mutation will not be given the chance to start uh, occurring and segregating in the population. Okay, 
So this is a, if an, a bad mutation enters. Okay, now we're looking at another kind of mutation, one that is very, very good to have. It might be something that, uh, that, um, that gives you a, a it, the exams we'll look at, we'll look at the, uh, some, uh, the EPAS1 gene in Tibetans, which is a variant, which is, may, makes you easier at, uh, at living in high altitude. So, so it might be, be this. It could also be a different kind of allele, which is uh, good to have. It might be uh, the, the lactase uh, gene that, um, that came, uh, that, that m many Europeans have. It's good, to, it gives us the ability to, to digest uh, the nutrition values in, in milk. So this one enters the population, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight haplotypes represented at this. Then the black one enters the population. It's very good to have this one, okay? So what happens now is that it's good to have this one. So with some chance due to uh, the population genetic stuff that Rasmus talked about, this allele will start to, uh, to, to segregate in the population. It, it will be better at, uh, at spreading out. Okay, so, so it will increase in, in frequency due to, uh, to positive uh, selection. Okay, so suddenly to begin with, it was only occurring in one copy. Now it actually occurs in four different uh, individuals from this population, okay? so. So it will increase the, the, the LD. So this is the link which disequilibrium. And this just talks about the, um, how much things are, are statistically associated with each other, close to each other on a genome. It will, uh, let's see the next, okay. So it will affect the, the variability in this region. Uh, so, it enters the population and then this one will start segregating. But this is not all that is happening because due to recombination, it will not just be this single variant. It will be the, high, the entire region that is very close to this uh, variant that is beneficial to have that will start to segregate. Okay, so it, it will, it's not just this position, it, it will be the entire region. This is why we are seeing that this one here is associated, this mutation will now be associated with this variant and this variant and this variant, this one, this variant. And these will be the variants that we uh, that will start uh, occurring. We can see here that if you get far away from the advantages, the advantageous mutation, then it's it's not really tightly linked with, the, with this, this good mutation. Okay, so due to, so that the positions that are close to this uh, good mutation are linked. What will happen is that uh, the whole region surrounding this mutation will start to um, will start to, to to look the same across the entire genome. So what you will have is that it will weed out many of the other neutral variant that exists in in, in that region, because this strong good mutation to have will. Uh, will have will have more power to, to segregate. So what we have, if there's been strong selection acting going on in a region, is that there will be a, a loss of uh, variability in, in that region. There will be a, a larger difference between the haplotypes that are advantageous to, to the other ones. And um, so, so this is the, the, the motivation for for, for what happen, what's happening with variants when, when there's a positive selection. So let's see here. Okay, so, um, so if there's a selection acting, then it will affect the, uh, the, the side frequency spectrum, but it's, it's not really clear exactly what, uh, how it changes the, the side frequency spectrum. So what can, what can we do? Well, there's, um, we can start to estimate uh, um, uh, a statistic, which is called the, um, the population scale, the mutation rate. And this is what uh, Rasmus called the uh, theta. And this is a compound um, estimator that has to do with both the, uh, 
the, the variability, but also the, um, the, the size of, of the population that, that you're looking at. It's a, it's a measurement of how much heterozygosity you, uh, you would have. If you have a extremely large population with a very, very low uh, mutation rate, then you will have um, some kind of heterozygosity, some kind of variability segregating. But if you swap it around, so you might also have had a, a very, very small population, but with a high mutation rate, then they would also have the same kind of variability. So we, can, we cannot, uh, these things are connected to each other, like the population size and, and the mutation rate. And we can, we can estimate these, uh, this population scaled mutation rate on the basis of, uh, of the site frequency spectrum. And this is um, the mathematically, the, the, it, it's a, it's a, it might be a bit involving to, to, uh, to prove, but uh, if you have your site frequency spectrum, here's an example of your site frequency spectrum. The left one is a neutral uh, uh, variation and so this is simulated. So the, the double ton category is half the size as the single ton. Then any uh, linear function, which is the sum of, uh, of categories of your frequency spectrum will be an estimator of, uh, of theta. This is what is called, uh, what, what we call general here. And alpha i are just uh, some uh, coefficients that you can put onto your different categories of your side frequency spectrum. In this example here, I'm not sure what this letter is called in Greek, uh, eta maybe, I'm not sure. So these are, the, let's call it the eta. So th this would be your side frequency spectrum. So this size that you have here, this entire expression is just uh, some coefficient which is specific to, to your category that you multiply with your with your, with your side frequency spectrum, and then just take the sum of all these, okay? So your, your theta estimator is a scalar value. It's a single value that is the, the product of, uh, of taking the, that, that is the, the result of taking the sum and the product of these uh, coefficient and, the, and your side frequency spectrum. So the, the most classic theta estimators are what is called the, uh, the uh, the waters and theta and this is extremely simple because they are all our coefficients that they're one so what we have here in this sum if you look at this we are starting the the our cipher spectrum starts at at zero because this is uh, the the category the bin where we are only observing derived alleles okay and it goes from zero to n and the last category is the one where we are only observing derived alleles. So this expression, this sum we are seeing here is the sum of the variable parts of your side frequency spectrum. Okay, so this is just the sum of all the variable sites you have on your genome. And then you have this um, A1 constant or, or this is a expression that, that takes into account that uh, the number of chromosomes that you are uh, that you are analyzing or that you have in your side frequency spectrum. So this is the water sun, and this is normally just called the, 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 the number of segregating sites, because if you have the number of variable sites, then you can, can calculate the, the theta. And the, another very, very uh, uh, common um, estimator of theta based on the side frequency spectrum is the one which is called the, the pairwise differences. I'm not sure that uh, Rasmus talked about this, but the, you, this is normally defined that you look at all your different sequences for all your individuals, and then you, you take how many differences do we observe between the, these two. So, um, so this is a sum of differences, and then you, in the end, you standardize by how, how many comparisons you have made. You can also uh, calculate this on the basis of the, your site frequency spectrum, right? So the number of pairwise differences can also be expressed as a function of your categories of your site frequency spectrum. And this is what we are seeing here. And then we are dividing by the number of comparisons we have made. 
So what's interesting here is that again, it's a sum over only the variable categories of your site frequency spectrum. Uh, eta i is your category number. So the, our, um, our alpha, the, 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 the coefficient that we're multiplying with is, uh, is a product of your category number and, and the n minus your category number. Okay, so this expression here will put a, the, the largest weight on the uh, on the intermediate frequencies, the, the one in the center. So I, I'm not going to go through all these uh, estimators of uh, of theta. The one that is uh, most interesting here would be um, would be Fu and Lee's because that is, is just the, the singleton category, and just with the singleton category you can. Um, you can you can estimate uh, you you can get an idea of what what, what the theta is for in, in your samples. So uh, at some point when you discuss uh, if you're looking at a side frequency spectrum and, and you want to come off as being extremely intelligent and clever, then you can just spot what the what the singleton category is, and then you can say, well, I think the uh, the theta for this population is this value. So in this example that we have here. We would say that the theta for the African population is uh, is around 0 0.37, but it's only uh, 0 0.21 for the Greenlandish population. But it's just an approximation. Okay. So uh, in this here, then from a neutral scenario, then we are calculating uh, all these different thetas. And the important thing here is that these theta estimators in the presence of a neutrality, if there's uh, no selection and no demography and no changes in population sizes, then all these thetas given enough data should give you the exact same value, okay? But certainly if there's a selection acting in the, in the region that we are analyzing, then these uh, these thetas will suddenly become uh, uh, very very different. Like the theta h will explode to a value of uh, over one thousand, and the water sun is uh, will drop to a value of six hundred and uh, and fifty. Okay, so suddenly these theta estimators, which should be an estimator of the same quantity and it gives roughly the same estimate in the case of neutrality, suddenly if there's something uh, fishy going on like selection, then these estimators behave uh, extremely differently. Okay. One thing you should also notice here is that in neutrality, we are estimating around the uh, uh, water and theta of 930. As soon as we have strong selection, the, the, the figure on the right is a very strong selection, then uh, our variability drops. So this also follows our intuition that if we have, uh, have selection acting, then we lose uh, variability. Okay, so we have these two, est we have estimators of, of theta. And th those behave the same if there's uh, neutrality, if there's a selection, then they behave very differently. And then our test statistic for finding, uh, for finding selection is just to look at the difference between these two uh, uh, theta estimators. And in the Tajima estimator, there we are using the difference between uh, the water sun and, the, and, and the, what is called theta pi, the, the number of pairwise differences. And then there are some mathematical details where we need to um, where we need to uh, standardize by, by, by the variance of, of the data. But, but that's not uh, conceptually; it's it's not important for the understanding. Okay, so this is what we can use for uh, for finding selection by the, using the differences in theta. So I think Rasmus talked about this, and I think it, a lot of people have talked about this Tibetan study. It was a study that I was uh, lucky enough to be involved with when I started uh, my, uh, my master, I think it was at the time. Yeah, and this was uh, 50 Tibetan individuals that were sequenced, and here we call it an average coverage of uh, 18x. So the, today, when, after I've worked more with ancient data, I would say this is very, very high coverage. So today, this is a more like a medium coverage, if not a low coverage. We had another data set where we had 40, uh, 
Chinese samples that were sequenced at a much lower uh, um, sequencing depth. Okay, and then we calculated uh, joint allele frequency. So this was what we call the the uh, two-dimensional side frequency spectrum. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you have seen this before, but if we if you notice that the x-axis goes from zero to 100, that's because we have 50 individuals, right? So it's uh, so how what. Either we can observe zero derived alleles or we can observe two times the number of uh, individuals we have. So it goes from zero to 100. So this is would be the, uh, the unfolded two dimensional side frequency spectrum. Okay, we had 40 uh, hand Chinese, so that goes up to 80. And then for each position on the genome, then you calculate how many uh, derived alleles do we observe in one population and the other population. So you do this for the entire genome. And then you calculate how many times did we observe uh, derived allele with, uh, with a frequency of uh, X in one population and Y in the other population. And then you just put this value into this heat map. And we can see here that of course it's much closer. Uh, it's it's on, the, the, on the diagonal as expected, but there were these extreme outliers. And um, what we uh, ended up doing here, was to, to define a statistic which is based on, uh, on the FST, which I think Rasmus also talked a bit about. Did Rasmus go through all these uh, this Tibetan study in his part? I think he didn't. Okay, okay. So so I'll I'll I'll, I'll go through this very fast so we get to, to the interesting part. You can estimate the the FST. The FST is a, is a measurement of difference between uh, populations. What we are interested in is calculating uh, uh, the branch that is private to, uh, to, to the Tibetan population. This is the branch where there certainly have been a, a great difference uh, in the uh, with regards to the privately to the Tibetans. So we had the Danish data set and we had the Han Chinese and we had the, the Tibetans. So for most of the genome, the Danish is a stronger, is more different from both the, the Tibetans and the Hans, right? So we are more different from these, whereas these are much closer. But then if you're looking at this EPAS1 region, then uh, if you calculate the FST value, then certainly the Tibetan branch becomes much longer. So it's a, it's a gene that, has, uh, that is much more different from, from all other regions in the genome. If you want to calculate this branch going from the center here to this one, then what we do is that we uh, take the sum of the, the branch that goes from T to D, and then we calculate the, the branch that goes from T to H, and then we can subtract this part because this is what we have, uh, because this is the part that, that we don't need. Then we have, of course, we've counted this one twice, but then we can take the, uh, half the, uh, just, well, it, it's a scalar, so it's, it's, it's just a constant two. Okay, so, I, and, and so some technical details is that if you, uh, FST, you cannot use this directly as, uh, as, as an estimator of the, of the, of the distance. So we need to uh, to transform it, and in this here we're using this uh, transformation. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Okay, I, uh, we need to move on a bit fast now. Okay, so this gene was very um, was segregating with very high frequency in um, in the Tibetans. Let's see what are we seeing here. So in in Danes we only observe the C allele. Okay. But in, uh, in, in the Tibetans, the G allele was segregating at almost uh, 90%, okay? And if you had that G, then it was very, um, then you, you, are, you are much better at adapting to high altitude and, uh, and you also have a lower chance of uh, exclemia during uh, pregnancy and um, and these things. So this is also what you can use the, the, the side frequency spectrum for. Okay. Secondly, um, let's see. Okay. I think Rasmus also talked a lot about this. This is like a genetic drift. 
if you have a very small population, then drift is uh, much more acting. But if you have a very large population, then it's not so sensitive to, uh, to, to, to genetic drift. So if you look at the Greenlandish uh, population, the Greenlandish population is, uh, is, is very small. It's also been, been, been isolated for a long time. So we would expect that they have a much smaller effective population size. So this is the site frequency spectrum from uh, five different populations. The Europeans, CEU, Chinese, CHP, Japanese, those are the green ones. Eurubans, those are people with an African ancestry from Nigeria, I think. And then we have the Greenlanders, GR. And as we saw earlier, the side frequency spectrum for, for the Greenlanders are much more flat. For the Eurubans, you, it's uh, it's much much higher. We have we also have much more variability. This is what we are seeing here. So Greenlanders has less than half the variability in uh, their population that what the Africans ha have. And you can see that the Europeans fall uh, somewhere in between. Okay, so similar to the two D SFS we did for the Tibetan study, we also did. Uh, the same for for the um, for the Greenlanders, and uh, here there's not this single uh, very very clear outlier just based on uh, on the visual inspection of your side frequency spectrum. But what is clear is that there are many more categories in this part here, whereas it drops very very fast with the with the Greenlandish ones. So this is the two DSFS. You could of course obtain the uh, the marginal uh, one DSFS by summing over all of the categories, but by collapsing them. So what what we do know from the Greenlandish population is that it um, is that the Greenlandish population split out around uh, uh, twenty three thousand years ago from the uh, East Asians. And they have been very, very uh, isolated. And there should be an effective population size of, uh, of only uh, 1,500. So we wanted to do this kind of uh, PBS statistic. This is what we call this, the, the brand statistic. We called it, we called it the Tibetan branch statistic, and but now it's more like called PBS, population branch statistic. So, because it of course works on all populations. So, uh, so we wanted to do this kind of tree-based FST again. And here's uh, uh, a, an estimate of the, of the population size, which is not really relevant for this. And then we, um, we made, uh, we looked at uh, where there were interesting uh, outliers based on this uh, the PBS statistic. And again, there was this uh, there was this cluster that is called the FATS uh, one, two, and uh, and three on chromosome uh, eleven. And this is uh, ended up being a very interesting study because it has to do with how uh, how two different things: how much energy you are able to obtain out of your fat in your body, and secondly, it's also uh, it's also associated with this. Uh, somewhat strange diet that the Greenlanders might have, uh, where you have many uh, proof as uh, poorly unsaturated fat acids. So this is the, the, what we found using these relatively simple uh, population genetic uh, tools was that um, uh, the genetic explanation for how uh, Greenlanders are able to survive in, in, in such a climate. Okay. So in all the things we have done so far, I've just talked about uh, uh, the, the side frequency spectrum and I, I've, I've defined it in the context of uh, called genotypes. So this is exactly what we, uh, what we cannot do, right? I think if there's one message that uh, you should go home with uh, from, uh, from these exercises is that uh, we want to know the genotypes, but it's very difficult to get genotypes. 
if you have high coverage data, you can. If you have low coverage, it's 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 very very difficult. So, and and there, there has been plenty of examples with this. We even went through a whole uh, exercise where we are uh, tried to call genotype using different approaches, and. Um, and it, as you could see, it, it always included some kind of uh, of bias. Okay, so uh, it's it's specifically a problem for low and medium coverage data. When do you have this? It's uh, it's when you have captured data where you are only using specific regions. You might not be uh, so rich, so uh, you cannot sequence uh, to a very high uh, high depth. You might also think that uh, assume that it's more important to increase the number of individuals in your sample rather than having more data from uh, from a shorter number of uh, a smaller number of samples. If you're working in the context of ancient DNA, I also talked about this. Then even if you are filthy rich, then you cannot get more sequencing data out of it, right? You 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 have what you have. It's uh, that you didn't have any more biological molecules. And you might also be in such a bad position that there's no more, more material for you to extract more DNA from. So this is what you have. Then you cannot get a uh, high coverage uh, data. So the question is, of course, when you're designing these uh, studies, how much data do, do you need? Well, it, again, it depends very much on, on, what, we, uh, on what, what we want to do. Some analysis there, you, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter so much. There's, there are methods like um, uh, the, 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 the D statistics, the ABABA, th those should work uh, for, for everything. At mixture uh, proportions that we'll talk about later on, that is, um, that is very sensitive to, to genotype calling, but it doesn't matter at all for uh, your SNP calling. You have SNP calling, figuring out which positions to include and and genotype calling, figuring out what the alleles are within an individuals. So depending on which statistic and analysis you want to, to do, it's um, a, that you can introduce different kinds of biases. What is so problematic about the side frequency spectrum, the SFS, that is that it's sensitive to both genotype calling and uh, SNP calling, okay? So here is a, an example from a study from John November. It goes back many years. I think it's back from 2015, maybe. So here they did a survey where they wanted to uh, to figure out how well they were able to um, to estimate um, the the side frequency spectrum in various scenarios. So there are um, there are the, the top row that is 2x sequencing data the middle row is 5x sequencing data and 10x means a depth of 10 sequencing data okay so depth and coverage i hope everybody remember this that's the number of reads we expect to overlap a specific position the right column here this is uh, the the true is what they have simulated and what they call the direct approach is the uh, that is the, the full model that, uh, that we have implemented in this software called, uh, called Angst, where we are using the, the genotype likelihoods and uh, full, very slow uh, statistical model. But, but it's the one that, uh, that works the best. The one you have in the, in the middle category, or the middle panel here, the, the blue ones, those are the one where you're doing multi-sample genotype calling, right? So we also talked about this the, the last time and, and the time before that, that when you're doing genotype calling, you can either do it based on your single individual or you can do it for multiple individuals and leverage the information that you have. So that is the middle column. And then the, the left panels here, those are where we are doing a, a genotype calling based on the single individuals. Okay, so, and they're comparing SAM tools and GATK or GATK. So these figures, imp an important thing to note is that these are uh, the genotype calling approaches that was used 
from many, many years ago in, in, in an earlier version. So it might not be how they behave today. Maybe they looked at these plots and improved their algorithm, but this was how it looked at the time. What we can see here is that if you're looking at the 2x scenario where we are expecting to uh, the mean depth of, of two, is to have only a two reads for each position, then the right one where we're using the genotype likelihoods works perfectly. The one in the uh, the one where we're doing joint calling does not really work for the rare variants like the singleton. It it actually seems to work for the uh, for the doubleton uh, category when we are using SAM tools, but but not get K. And if you are doing two uh, X sequencing and you're doing single sample genotype calling, then you cannot estimate the singleton and the doubleton category of your site frequency spectrum. They seem to work for uh, for the uh, for the triple ton and so forth. But that is also because those categories you are, um, the, those, those are easier to, uh, to, uh, to estimate in, in your frequency spectrum. It's very, very difficult to, to, to get the singleton category because there you need to have such a good uh, SNP calling algorithm that you are able to, to weed out this single heterocyclous individual out of a pool of maybe 50 individuals. And then this heterocyclous individual, is it a heterocyclous individual or is it due to sequencing errors? So it's a very, very difficult problem. So that's the 2x. Let's go down to 10x because that's very easy to talk about, right? There, everything seems to work. So if you have 10x sequencing data, then no matter the approach you're using, it, it, uh, it seems to work uh, relatively well. If you have 5x, which I would say is around to the low end of uh, medium coverage, then, um, then the, the single, well, actually, I would say that none of these actually work. I thought they, they worked better. Well, it works for the doubleton category, but for the singleton category, it doesn't uh, seem to work. Okay, so um, let's see, maybe this one. Yeah, so in here, they're, they're just doing um, the raw genotype uh, calling. So you could might argue that it's a problem of not choosing the proper filters when you're doing the, the sequencing, when you're doing the downstream analysis and the genotype calling. So here they tried with different uh, filters, like a minimum quality of the genotype calling and the, and the minimum depth you require for when you do the genotype calling. And none of these actually seems to work uh, very well for, uh, you have to go up to 10X before it, uh, it, it seems to work. Okay, so here let, let's let's not go into the full uh, math details. We can estimate the the side frequency spectrum on the basis of um, of uh, called genotypes. That's very easy. That's just counting the number of alleles. If you're working in a context of genotype likelihoods, then you do not have you do not know what the the genotype uh, is, but you have the probability of the ten different genotypes, then you can, uh, then you can define a, a, a likelihood function like this. And this is, uh, conceptually, it's a very, very difficult uh, combinatorial exercise because you need to go through all the different uh, ways that you could, uh, could get one sing uh, one heterocyclous individual out of everything, so it's a huge, huge sum. And and we have so this is the likelihood function for actually calculating this. We have a, a dynamic algorithm, and we are we are work, currently working on a on a project where we have improved how, the speed of this calculation a, a lot. So. This is the likelihood function. I will not go into details. We assume that we can calculate the, the likelihood. Theta here is our side frequency spectrum. D is, is the data. So we assume that we can calculate it for a specific site. Okay, so if you want to get the, the side frequency spectrum for an entire region, then you just say, you assume that every uh, position is independent, then we just take the product. This also highlights one of the uh, issues with the side frequency spectrum. The side frequency spectrum is, uh, I think, the most important uh, summary statistic of, uh, 
of a sample of individuals from a population. But what you do not have here is that you do not have this locality information, right? You lose the spatial information of your, um, of your data. And then if we wanted to get the, um, the, the overall estimate for, uh, for a region, of your side frequency spectrum, then you can of course try to find the theta that maximizes this expression. That's one approach. Another approach is of course to, uh, to use an a empirical base approach where you have, uh, where you can calculate the, uh, uh, your side frequency spectrum for a subset of sites or, or maybe from an entire, uh, from your entire data set and then use that as a prior to get, uh, to get the, uh, the, the information for a specific site. Okay, so let's see. I think we already had this one. Yes, this is what, what I'm uh, explaining here because if we uh, wanted to do the, um, the yes. if we wanted to, to, in, to, to scan the genome for, um, for these outliers, either it, it could either be the uh, an analysis like uh, selection for like for it's a GMSD that is based on the theta, so it could be FST. Then we need to go over uh, the, the the entire genome in uh, in Windows, and then we can look for uh, how these are uh, how if there are specific windows or blocks of the genome that that, that behaves very differently. If we have very a very small region, say a one megabase region, then it's not uh, easy to get a proper full maximum likelihood estimate because there are so little informative sites in, 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 in a region. So what we're doing there is that we are calculating a prior based on the entire genome. And then we're using that at the per site estimate of these uh, sample allele frequencies. And then we can get a proper per site uh, estimate of the, of, your, of, of the different theta estimates. And since the, the theta estimates are, are linear functions of your site frequency spectrum, then you can just take the, the sum of the per site uh, theta estimates. And the sum of these uh, per site estimates, are, it's in itself the uh, posterior probabilities of your site frequency spectrum based on the uh, sample allele frequency and the prior information of your of your site frequency spectrum okay that that's obtained as a from the whole data set okay so so this is uh, where we are calculating uh, this is the last example for this sfs and then we, sh we should move on fast um so here we are applying our approach for um for for the it's a gmsd in um, on a human data set in the, in the lactase uh, regions for, for 3x uh, sequencing data. And this is um, what is uh, made red here is where the lactase region is. And when you're doing this sliding window approach across the genome, then we are actually able to recover that there is some kind of uh, something going on in this region, okay? using this uh, empirical base approach. The other lines that you're seeing here is, is where we are trying to, co to call genotypes in, in, in different ways. In uh, these sliding windows approaches are always a bit uh, tricky to use because they depend on the, on the window size. If you make the windows too big, then you lose uh, kind of sensitivity because if you make the window the entire genome, then you are not really capturing anything that's local. So it's a bit tricky uh, how to uh, how to to do how to choose this in practice. What people end up doing is that they choose different. Uh, they do blocks along the genome, and then they uh, uh, use different uh, different uh, sizes and. And it's also a visual inspection that we're doing here. What you can't do is to uh, calculate for every block of the genome and then uh, look at the, the outliers and see what's top 10 of the one that looks most uh, strange. Okay. Okay, so this, so if uh, you are wanted to apply this, uh, the full genotype uh, likelihood approach for analyzing the, uh, the data, it's, it's implemented in this software called the uh, angst that I've been 
that I've been using and, and writing and uh, and developed uh, over the last couple of years. I'm not going. That's 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 a full example on uh, on on, uh, on the GitHub or no on uh, on, the, on the Digi page associated with this Angst project on how to do uh, these uh, SFS estimates together with the population brand statistics and the, the uh, and doing the window statistics and the tajimas and thetas and there's an examples for for everything if this had been more like a class uh, exercise that there would have been an exercise where you would have been given a toy example and then been asked to estimate the the global sfs and then do these kind of um, of window analysis, but okay, I, I need a five minutes break to get some more coffee and then I'll talk about the uh, admixture. Okay, so, so five minutes breaks. Okay. Okay, okay I think uh, I should continue that's the we only have uh, around the uh, 45 minutes uh, left. Okay, I, so I'm continuing now. So what I'll talk about is not so much PCA, but more like a admixture proportion. So uh, did Rasmus talk about this? I think he, he might have mentioned, so, so I'll just go through it uh, briefly and then, then an example of how to, uh, to compute these things. So if um, what you'll see many times uh, in the literature is a figure that looks like this, okay? So what we are seeing here is, um, is, a, is a bar plot with, with different colors. So each very, very small bar here represents a, a genome, okay? So if, it, if this single bar, very small, so, when I, so this would be the, for many individuals, right? This would be individuals from a population known as the Madinkans. Okay, so if you look at the at the at the proportion of, of colors for for each bar, then th it's the proportion of uh, of the uh, admixture within an individual, meaning that it's the it's the proportion of the, the individual's genomes that is uh, belongs to to a different kind to, to different populations. Okay. If you look at the, all those on the left here, the one that are dark red are, are, are Africans. And you can see that um, a population known as the Ethiopians, those seems to be a mixture between uh, the, between the, the, the other uh, populations that are full red and then something which is more blue, which is something which in this figure looks more like a, a, a component which comes from, from the Middle East, which also follows a bit with our, our intuition for, from Ethiopia. So, so this is, um, so based on this, you, you can uh, get like an, an, an idea about uh, um, the, the origins and, and the components that, uh, that defines the genetic uh, markup for uh, for population and, and for individuals and and if you go to 23andMe and, and I'm sure they uh, they produce these kind of figures where you can see that uh, that uh, where where you're from in uh, in your in the world genetically, so a person that's um, that is a mixture between a a person from uh, China and and Europe would, if you if you were to to make an admixture plot of this, it would look like they were half um, Chinese and half European. So uh, so these are the kind of analysis that people are very interested in, in doing. So so another way that uh, that we also try to to visualize and understand the the origin of um, of a, of an individual or population is of course to, to do some something like a PCA plots. So, uh, but I, I I doubt that we'll have time to go uh, into this. So again, I talked about the, the Greenlanders. Here here is a a very interesting example. So the Greenlanders is a very interesting uh, uh, 
population, especially with regards to, to their genetic material, because they are, have been in this very small population for, for so long. So it's also easier to find something that has been um, uh, demography that's been acting and, and selection also has a much larger impact in these uh, in the small isolated population. So Greenlanders have uh, have historically uh, in the last uh, few hundred years been under the uh, Danish jurisdiction. I it might even be considered a kind of a colony still if. Uh, if that's one way to, to see it. So there's been a lot of admixture going on. People uh, from, uh, from Denmark that moved to, uh, to, to Greenland got, a, a, got married and, and had kids. And then the, their kids will be admixed. Then they'll be a, have a, a mixture of, uh, of, of the genome that's uh, comprised by the traditional Greenland and traditional uh, European ancestry, so we can try to uh, to make these kind of admixture plots. I haven't I haven't talked about how to do it, but we can do this for for uh, for the individuals, and then we can see that that there's this very strange uh, gradient of um, of um, of people and how how they are admixed. And what's uh, very interesting is to see that, um, okay, so here as a reference, we have the, the, the Danish population. The Danish population here, those are completely red almost, right? So all, almost red. And then there are uh, another uh, individuals coming from the Tassilak community, which has almost no uh, European admixture. So without knowing anything about the details, I would assume that these were the villages that came from way up north where, where people from Denmark and Europe would not bother traveling up. But if you look at these regions down here, these villages that you have, small villages, then you can see in every city, uh, uh, there's the population is a mixture between Europeans and, uh, and, and Greenlanders. Uh, so this, of course, also complicates the uh, any kind of uh, downstream analysis that that you uh, that you uh, wanted to do because um, many of the analysis we are doing is that we are assuming that uh, the individuals come from one population. Then suddenly you have an individual which is from one population from another population. So it, it complicates your 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 downstream analysis. So overall, there's around 27% uh, European admixture in, in Greenland. This is what you can uh, see here, how, how it's, it's being distributed. Yeah. There's very little ad admixture in the East. There's a, a lot in the West. And you can also see uh, the proportion of uh, of individuals that has that has no European uh, gene flow or ancestry, this is also what we in the in these Tassilak villages, and then uh, so it's a, a very very few individuals from Greenland that doesn't have a, a Europe, European uh, gene flow. Okay, and we can try to do the same with with the PCA analysis. That then we get something that looks like this. Again, we can see some kind of clustering, but it's not clear exactly how to interpret the uh, PCAs. There's a whole, uh, there's a long list in the literature where, where people are discussing how, how much we can do analysis from PCAs. There's also uh, other approaches that might be more suitable than the standard PCA. That these are the stochastic approaches that's come out like UMAP and, and these tools. Okay, so. So that was hopefully motivation to why this can be uh, interesting to, to do. So uh, I'll talk about the, uh, the classic admixture model. And then I'm talking about, uh, I'll show some problems with this and then how, what our solution to, to, to this would be. There's going to be some math similar to the, uh, to the expectation maximization. But as soon as you get to that part, then I'll just, uh, I think I'll just skip it given the, 
the, the time we have. Okay, so um, we are assuming that we have um, individuals. We have, we have one. We have a group of individuals, some samples, and we do not know uh, anything about these. Then we can make some assumptions. We can say, okay, we are assuming that uh, these are the product of of some admixture events from uh, from two or maybe three uh, ancestral hypothesized uh, populations that we do not know anything about. So these would be the original. Uh, founder populations that has given rise to, to the uh, to the maybe at mixed individuals that we are seeing now okay and uh, it might be two or three or uh, we can just say that we have a k ancestral or source populations okay and given that they have uh, at mixed they might have at mixed then uh, if you look at a in individual then uh, then proportions of that genome will come from either of the one to K populations. Okay, so these are what we call the admixture proportions. Okay. Hopefully this is clear. This is the, this is the thing that, that we are going to estimate. The admixture proportion is the proportion of an individual's genome that belongs to, to different uh, ancestral or source or hypothesized uh, populations that does not exist anymore right so, so these are our populations that we are uh, that we are founder populations that we that uh, we have no idea anything about and in, when we look at the at mixture plots it's it seems to be clear that there's a component that acts as a european and a african and a and uh, Central uh, Asia, similar to this, right? Central, South, and East Asia. It's clear that there's some kind of clustering in these different. So the Europeans also looks more dark blue here, but but the interpretation of what these founder populations are is is not uh, well defined. Okay. So we have these um, we have these uh, two individuals. This one and this one. This is that genome. If we go back in that pedigree, then we can see at some point there was one admixed individual here, father, mother, or mother, father. Then one chromosome is of uh, one ancestry and the other chromosome is from the other ancestry. Then this one, these two people will admix and then only the, rip, the red part here remains. We can do the same from these two. And then suddenly we have uh, these chromosomes, which are uh, um, the, a combination of the individuals. Uh, so th there will be regions of the genome that uh, belongs to these different populations. So, but we cannot observe these, right? We, we know that they exist due to how recombination work and. Uh, and the overall biology, but, but we do not know anything about wh where they are. We just know that this has had to have happened. Okay, so, so if, we, uh, if we wanted to analyze uh, this and get these admixture proportion, there are some very, very classic tools like structure, which was the, the first one. These are, in, in today's world, they are a bit too slow. They are built on, I think it's a MC, MC approach and there's something called BAPS. But I think the one that, that uh, most people are using these days are the maximum likelihood versions uh, that's implemented in the software called Admixture. And, and they, uh, their inference is uh, in these tools are all based on uh, that you need to do SNP calling and then genotype calling and based on the genotype calling, then you can infer the uh, Admixture proportions. And uh, in order for, for this to happen, then you also need to estimate the uh, allele frequencies for uh, these uh, K founder populations. This is something we are, we are only interested in the, in the in these uh, mixture proportion, but we also need to, uh, to estimate the ancestral uh, frequency or the frequencies for these founder populations at the same time. 
So here's another example. We have the Africans, we have Europeans, then we have African Americans, and then we can see that they do that they make this kind of gradient of people that have more European than people that have more African ancestry, and then there's this continuum. Okay, so if we are um, Um, so what, what we want to do is to, uh, to, to define some kind of uh, maximum likelihood model that uh, kind of encapsulates this, uh, th this kind of structure. And then we want to find some way to, uh, to find the, the parameters, all right, mixture proportion and frequencies that explains that the data we're observing the most, right? So this is a classic uh, uh, maximum likelihood uh, model, right? So this could be our, what, what we want to optimize. And this is uh, when we've done optimizing them, then we, our result will be the admixture proportions that, uh, that gives the highest likelihood. Okay, so, okay, so, uh, so what we have here, last week, I talked a bit about this uh, coin toss example. The coin toss example was uh, that you were, you had a biased coin. You had two biased coin, but, but with different kind of biases. So it would land on hit more than it would, uh, the other one would, and it, it wasn't equal. Uh, it, it, there weren't 0 0.5 probability of getting either heads or tails. And then uh, what we wanted to see was um, what was the biases. And, and at the same time, we also wanted to see what kind of, uh, how many times we had chosen either coin. So conceptually, this is very, very much the same. So the frequencies we are estimating would be the, the bias of these coins and the at mixture probabilities that we uh, want to uh, figure out, that would be um, uh, that would be the overall time that uh, that we had uh, the, our, our, our mixture probabilities from the coin. How many times we had coin one and coin two? So if we have known ancestry, this was similar to the coin toss example that when we if we knew which coin we were using then we could directly just by counting the number of times we had heads and tails, then we could see what the bias was and we could see how often we had, we had chosen the different uh, coins. Okay, so for this individual one, this is comprised of, uh, we, this is with known ancestry. Then the red one it means that we have uh, one ancestry and the blue means there's another ancestry. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, alleles in a diploid organism. So we have 16 different alleles. Four of those are the one with, uh, with blue ancestry. So the uh, mixture proportion for, for this individual is four divided by 16. And uh, the admixture proportion for, uh, for, for, for the second population is uh, 12 divided by 16. Of course, it can, we can also have written a population two as one minus this admixture probability because we only have two, um, uh, two population. If we had had three populations, then the last population three would have been one minus the sum of these proportions. So we can do this for uh, for all the um, for all the populations or for, for all the individuals, and then we can. Uh, we can also calculate the allele frequencies for these different uh, hypothesized uh, ancestral populations. So for the blue ones, here we are observing uh, one A, one, two, no, so two A's and one, two, three T's. Okay, so it's five alleles in total. Two of these are A, so it's two over five. Okay, if we look at the red, at, at the red alleles, the one that has uh, that uh, comes from the other population, then we are only observing T's. So our allele frequency would be a zero in that case. So for these frequencies, those should not add, add, add up to one. Okay, this is similar to, to, to the coin toss uh, bias. Okay, so we can calculate these frequencies for each of these 
populations and uh, or for, for each uh, site. And we can calculate uh, admixture probabilities for uh, for each uh, each individual. Okay. So so most basically the um, if we know what the Q and, and, and our admixture proportion and the and allele frequencies are, and we know what the genotype is, our data, then we can uh, write the, this likelihood function for one individual and for one dialectic locus. Okay, Q, our admixture probabilities, G is our genotype, and uh, F is our, uh, our frequencies. So the first thing we do is that we, uh, we calculate this kind of pooled allele frequency where we take into account the, um, the admixture proportion for an individual with regards to the allele frequencies in the different populations. So this would actually be the probability of the allele itself. If you were... Um, given the very simple case where the admixture probability for, for one individual, for one side. No, we had a person with complete uh, European ancestry. So his admixture proportion would be, uh, would be one for the uh, European. And then we, he has a zero probability of having a uh, admixture from an uh, African uh, uh, population. So in that case here, then the Q1 would be one and Q2 would be zero. So in that case, the only information we would have from the, at the population frequency level would be from the European part. If he had half and half, or she had uh, half ancestry from, uh, from uh, European and African ancestry, then it would have been, uh, we, have, we would have been, we have put equal weights on these allele frequencies. Okay, so this is the, the pooled uh, uh, frequency, well, uh, admixture uh, corrected uh, allele frequency uh, estimate. We call this HIJ to make our life easier. And then assuming uh, Heidi Weinberg, then we can, uh, we, we can get this kind of uh, likelihood function. So this is, of course, if we are, if our genotype here we call, okay, so normally when we are working with called genotypes in a deployed context, we, we identify and define a genotype by the count of the, uh, of the minor allele. So a genotype, which is called zero, would mean that it's uh, all minor alleles. A genotype one would mean that it's, um, that it's a heterozygous, and if a genotype two, then it would mean that it's uh, the other way around, homozygous for the uh, for the major. Depending on how uh, how this is being flipped, of course, but th this is what the, the notation means. So this is the the likelihood for one individual for one uh, one site. Okay, we assume independence now uh, between both individual and and um, for both individuals and uh, and sites, so it of course turns into this kind of double product, right? So this was the information that we had for one individual for one site. Then we now loop over uh, all the uh, individuals and then all sites, and this turns into a product, okay? And then what we what we seek to find are the admixture proportions and the frequencies that maximize this expressions. So given our genotype data, which is a huge matrix of containing of the entries zero, one, and two, then we uh, have these two other huge matrices uh, called um, co containing float values. These are not zero, one, and two. One contains the admixture proportions and the other contains the, uh, the allele frequencies for these founder populations. Then we need to find out what the uh, or which combination of Qs and F that, that maximize this. So this is a huge, huge uh, optimizational uh, uh, problem with many, many uh, parameters. Say we have um, five 
we want to run the admixture analysis with five uh, founder populations. Okay, so K is five. Assuming that we have a uh, hundred individuals, and we had, um, and we wanted to analyze, uh, we had put on very very rigorous. Uh, snip calling so we had uh, 1 million uh, sites that, to an, uh, analyze okay so so first the, the frequencies how many par how many parameters are we optimizing in this frequency matrix so for, we have 1 million sites and we had uh, five we assumed five ancestral populations so we need to optimize just for for the uh, founder frequencies this is would be 5 million parameters that we are optimizing. And at the same time as we're optimizing these uh, hypothesized founder frequencies, then we are also uh, estimating the, uh, the admixture proportions, okay? And with the admixture proportions, therefore each individual, you have one individual and we had, um, and we had the all admixture proportion, which was five. So there we would have uh, 500, uh, uh, admixture proportions that we are estimating. And these are, of course, are a bit interconnected, similar to, to our coin source example, okay? Our coin source example, this was a combination of uh, how often did we change coin and uh, and what were the biases? So it's, it's very much the same, but it's a huge uh, parameter space and people are not analyzing this with 1 million uh, sites. What they're what they're doing in practice is that they have uh, 64 million sites because that's the uh, that's the overall uh, proportion uh, that's the overall number of variable sites in a human genome. So it's a huge huge uh, optimizational problem, and I I, I don't think uh, the, the standard optimization approaches like uh, steepest descent and. Uh, Brighton Fletcher and uh, all these gradient based approaches will work for this. I've never tried, but I don't think it's possible. I know that some people are trying to use some kind of machine learning to, uh, to uh, estimate uh, these things, but I, I'm not sure this is an ongoing project. So it's a huge, huge parameter space. And now we're getting to the part that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll skip. I think we can rewrite the, how the, uh, the likelihood function, I can see there's a typo here. The, the, the likelihood function is written. And when we do this, then it's also uh, the, uh, the Q function that we're using in the EM falls out uh, naturally together with the maximum, um, with the maximization step. So this is just to, uh, to improve it. And in practice, this is uh, what we are, um, what is being uh, optimized. So the, all these horrible equations and uh, and what seemed like a very very uh, uh, complicated uh, expression actually turns out into something which is very um, which is very simple. So um, so we can um, yes. So here here's an example which is um, similar to the coin toss example. This is, uh, if we know the ancestry, then we have all these uh, probably, uh, these frequencies and these ad admixture proportions. Let's see what time it is. We have all these admixture proportions, but we do not have these uh, admixture proportions. So, so we are assuming that we have a, 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 a guess, we have something we initialize with, and then similar to the coin source example, then we can uh, can update both the, uh, the frequencies and the uh, admixture proportions. So this is, um, um, so this is, it's, there's a lot of math, but, but I conceptually it's the same as, the, as this uh, coin source example. You can look at the values and see if they are making sense. What we are actually optimizing is what we are calculating are these probabilities. Yeah. So first we calculate the, the new a new Q, and then based on these uh, Q, the, the, the mixture proportions, then we can update the, the frequency proportions. 
So again, it's the same as the uh, coin source example. Yeah. I'm not sure how, how relevant uh, these details are, but it's, it is interesting to see. Okay, so of course, genotype calling, the one thing you should remember is that it's uh, difficult to do. And uh, if you have low coverage data, so uh, if you are to um, are to uh, to analyze this, if you are to simulate data and then see how uh, how the method works for uh, low coverage data, then you can get something that will uh, look like this. So we are simulating. I think it's um, fifty individuals. We have ten individuals from one population. 10 individuals from another population, 10 individuals from a third population. We have 10 individual, which is a mixture, half and half of these two populations. And then we have uh, our final uh, subpopulation here, which is a mixture of all three um, uh, founder populations. Of course, I cannot see how in, in practice that this would have happened that it was exactly one third. Okay, so this is our true ancestral states. Then we are simulating for each of these individuals. Then we are uh, from a Poisson distribution. We are pulling, we're generating a, a sequencing depth. Here we are assuming a sequencing depth of four, I think. So for the first individual, we are assuming that we have a 2x sequencing data. For the fifth individual, we have more than, uh, we have five. Um, a sequencing depth of five. So there we should be able to call genotypes uh, much better. So then we uh, call genotypes and applied this to the standard maximum likelihood approaches based on the called uh, genotypes. And this is what we are seeing here. So in, um, we call genotypes using three different uh, approaches. Let me see what the next one is. Yes. So with using three different uh, approaches, which one doesn't really matter. What, what is clear is that uh, they, they don't really uh, seem to work that well. For some reason, it has, uh, it's better at figuring out the, the second ancestral population than the, the first one. Maybe it has to do with uh, some, some uh, individuals with very low sequencing depth. If um, we can also see that in, in this fourth subpopulation, which was a components of one third, it, it doesn't really seem to, well, it does seem to work when we are assuming Heidi Weinberg. And then we have these. So it's, it's not really clear that, that these uh, called uh, genotypes approaches uh, Work. Well, it's, it's, at least it's difficult to, uh, to, uh, to interpret directly. Also, given that what we have in reality when we have high coverage data uh, at mixture proportion that looks like this, right? So it's, uh, we really want to be able to infer these with, uh, with a higher uh, correctness than, than just by a sh just staring at it. So with the other approach we had where we were, where we were using the genotype likelihood approach there we are, then our results from our maximization problem looks uh, exactly like this. And this is very, very close to, uh, to the truth that what we are simulating from. So in order to investigate this further, we, uh, we now made uh, two scenarios. One, for the first 25 individuals, oh, sorry. Uh, Just a second here. Um, yes. So can, can you still see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, super. Okay, so the first 25 individuals, those have very high coverage. The remaining one have extremely low coverage. And then when we try to call genotypes, none of the methods really work that well. We can see that the one down here where we have high coverage, 
Well, it seems to recover the first ones very, very good, but it cannot distinguish between these two scenarios we have up here. And if you have, uh, if you're looking at the other ones, it's uh, equally uh, less informative. But if you're using the genotype likelihoods where we do not perform a uh, hard calling of the genotypes, then we are able to recover what looks exactly the same as the other scenario. So this it shows another problematic thing with, uh, with, this, uh, with this genotype calling is that it's extremely sensitive to this variable coverage we have. And something that uh, people are not doing that much anymore uh, is that they have one study where, where they were aiming for sequencing depth of say uh, five, and then they want to merge the results from that study with, with, uh, with another study that they had pulled in from a collaborator where they had a sequencing depth of 10. And then they want to treat everything the, the same way. So they call genotypes exactly the same way. But since the data was not generated in the same way, it's not a suitable approach to, to, to do. So the, the, the biases we are seeing is, uh, is very much correlated with the, the sequencing uh, depth so, okay, genotype likelihoods. We wanted to extend the admixture model into a genotype likelihood context. So we have the probability of the data given our genotype. We talked a lot about this. We take all the, the observed bases and the quality scores, and then we calculate this uh, probability measurement for all of the 10 different uh, genotypes. So we talked a lot about this the last time. So I don't think we need to go into much details. Again, we are uh, the notation we are using is that we have 10 different genotypes, but we assume that sites are, uh, are dialectic. We can only observe two different alleles. If we can observe only two different alleles, then we have three possible genotypes. Then we uh, denote the, the genotypes with the count of uh, derived alleles. Okay, so... If a value of a genotype two, that would be homozygous for the derived allele. A genotype zero would be a homozygous for the um, for the uh, for the major allele or the alternative allele, depending on how these are polarized. Okay, so um, again, let's see here. It's um, this was our original likelihood function. And what we do now in, in all its uh, simplicity is that we are now, we are not assuming that you have a single hard call of, the, of your genotype. Of course, notation wise, we have 10 different uh, genotypes, but we're only interested in three of them. And the three we're interested in, we call those zero, one, and two, okay? So this likelihood function we have up here, in the context of um, of called genotypes, then we are just picking whatever um, genotype we're observing and then uh, calculating this. If we are not, if we don't have a hard call of the genotype, then but given a probability of the genotype, which is this part here, right? The probability of the data given the genotype. This is now a value. If it a, has a very low probability, then it would be very close to zero. Then this expression over here uh, doesn't matter. And then we just, we, we, we are looping over all three possible uh, genotypes. And then we put in weights and the weights that we are using are the, um, are the genotype likelihoods. Okay. So if we are working with the, uh, data where the genotype likelihoods are, are known with uh, intensity of zero or one zero zero or zero one zero or zero zero one, right? Then these two likelihoods are exactly the same, okay? And then we are, well, it's the same exercise with rewriting the, uh, the, uh, the maximization step and it turns into, um, into this. Here we are, one thing that I personally is very interested in and I, is, how, is always how to optimize things. We, we can come up with super elaborate uh, methods for, uh, 
for a statistical model that uh, that contains every aspect of uh, of the data and the model, but but it might be so over parametrized uh, that we'll do uh, that, that it's not possible to, to do in practice. What they're doing in uh, in and uh, in the uh, admixture method is uh, the, the source code for the admixture is uh, proprietary it's closed source so we cannot see what they're doing but apparently they're, they're doing multiple em steps and then they're coupling this with the uh, newton rapson approach so what we are doing here in the in this paper the or method called ngs admix is that we are doing an accelerated em where we're doing multiple em steps and then uh, we are getting the next results by um, by taking like the linear combination of the of the square differences between successive uh, EM steps, this is um, I'm not sure which one is faster. Actually, I do think that the one that mixture is uh, this linear search it does using user wraps. I think that is uh, a bit faster, maybe. At least that was how I. Uh, how, how, how I remember it from many. So this is actually a method that goes many years back. There's um, there's been an, a, a multiple additions to this since then. Since this in the uh, back then, if you are um, what people have mostly is to have um, like a snip chip reference data set with uh, individuals. And then instead of actually optimizing and figuring out these ancestral hypothesized uh, uh, populations, what you can't do is to fix these uh, ancestral frequencies or founder frequencies with uh, with what you uh, with what what you want them to be uh, framed as instead, right? So you're making a European a proper European component. And this is, is more like a supervised uh, approach. And then you can, um, if you are, if you have this kind of uh, reference SNP chip data set, then you don't really need to optimize uh, all these thousand and thousand parameters if you're just coming with one single individual. If you got your genome sequence at uh, 23 and me, then um, you can just then you just need to figure out what the admixture proportions are for you as an individual. You just because you come and add yourself as a single individual to a data set with two thousand individuals, you wouldn't really expect your uh, your ad ad mixture proportions in these other individuals to change, or even your uh, or you might not even need to update your uh, these founder frequencies. But it's of course the correct thing to do. But in practice, it would it should it wouldn't change that much. I think. Okay, so. Um, the EM algorithm where we're using the uncertainty of the data is uh, is written as as this. That. So I remember that the math in this was uh, horribly uh, complicated. It was um, we had a proper uh, mathematician Lena Scott that was uh, uh, validating many of these things and proved that it was indeed a valid EM algorithm. Okay, and. Um, this was the, this was the, let's see. Okay, super. Okay, so this was, uh, this was a result from before. Uh, this team's type black dude approach works uh, equally well, no matter the, the sequencing uh, depth. And now there's, uh, there should have been these exercises for 15 minutes, but I can see that the time is up. So are there any uh, questions for anything I've gone through uh, to today. Hopefully it was a, a bit, uh, it wasn't as confusing as the last time. Hmm. So I'm assuming since there are no questions that uh, everything was clear or maybe people are uh, a bit shy maybe if uh, if there's other questions uh, you can always uh, write them in an email and then i'll uh, we, we can take it from there in case if you are so shy that you don't want to ask in uh, in front of everybody 
If you wanted to try out these, uh, how to use these in practice for uh, for your data, then it's um, then there's uh, the in GSAT mix tutorial that I put in the uh, in the chat window, and then the the whole wiki page for uh, for. Um, for, for angst also contains uh, examples for, for many, many things. All right, thank you very much, Torfin. Uh, maybe one small question. So what is the difference between all this uh, structured mixture, fast structure and other variants? Yes, so the um, uh, the um, so what we are really estimating here are the global uh, proportions for the entire individual. What there has been a lot and a lot of development within uh, the last couple of years has been to, to do this uh, localized, to give a locality on it. So where so if you have an individual, then you can loop over the genome and then you can point at this specific region and then say it belongs to, to this specific uh, population. So it's the, fundamentally, it's a bit the same model, I would assume it's just another parameterization. But what makes this very complicated in a context of, uh, of uh, sequencing data is of course that we uh, we do not have the face of the uh, of the of the genotype, so we do not know if uh, if the allele comes from the maternal pattern, and you need to have this information when you're doing the painting. This is called a uh, painting, a mixture painting. Yeah, uh, I think they use uh, at least Stevens model to do that, right? Yes, I would um, for for doing the facing. No, no, for like inferring uh, like local ancestries. Well, I think there are, are many methods out there. It's not something that I've used uh, personally, but I think there was there's this guy. We, we so it's sorry. I ho hopefully he will he'll never see this on on a YouTube stream. But I always forget his name. And and uh, and I've even met him, which makes it even worse. I think he's he's in Ireland, and he's uh, he's doing so many of these. It's it's so it's like when you want to do imputation, then uh, fundamentally it's the the it's the same model that has been used for the last uh, ten years. It's just better heuristics at doing it. Mm -hmm. And to my understanding, when we are doing when they're doing uh, ancestral painting. It's uh, fundamentally the, the same algorithm that's been using with different kind of heuristics. Yeah, but I think that's uh, Leon Stevens model usually. Yes, yes, yes. Like chrome paint and yes. others. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. Russ has uh, one of these methods. Ah, okay. Yeah. It's uh, all of them are like HMM based. Yes. But. Uh, do you know if there are any methods which are like reference free? Because usually these methods, they rely on uh, uh, yes. some like uh, reference oh, you genomes. Need this, you need to have this information beforehand and you need to have faced the uh, genotypes uh, in order to do these things uh, properly. In, yeah. And also, um, it's also mostly interesting in the context of, uh, of human data because yeah. you need to have these uh, proper refined and curated uh, references in order to do things. Yeah. It's, it's not possible to do with uh, something. Yeah. Well, if, if you can do a uh, imputation and you can do facing, then you can, of course, uh, also with a very high degree, do these kind of paintings. But if you cannot do that to begin with, then you're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. Actually, I wonder, so of course, if you like have uh, a mixed population and you don't have like any references at all, uh, you wouldn't be able to estimate uh, ancestries at all. Mm. Uh, yeah. Say again? Uh, like, uh, if you don't have any references, then of course, it's uh, like, I don't know, almost impossible or very difficult to estimate uh, 
uh, to like detect uh, different uh, founding populations uh, mm -hmm. because you do not have any information. But let's say uh, you have uh, uh, admixed population and uh, you have a reference for one population, but you do not have a reference for the second founding mm -hmm. population. Then I think it should be possible to like uh, detect those two ancestries. Do you know if any yes, methods so. implement that? Uh, but even in the uh, in the classic uh, admixture and the structure approach, where we do not have to make a, a assumptions about. Uh, what the ancestral hub, uh, we, well, we call them ancestral populations because this is our interpretation of, of what they are. But in reality, it's a, it's like a founder population that is have given rise to the uh, to the uh, variations that we observe, and they seem to make conceptually sense with what we would expect. But I, I would have that I think. Uh, I think uh, now I forget the guy's name, but there are some scenarios where a specific uh, demog demographic, uh, a, spe a special demo demography will give rise to a, a an admixture a, a pattern which is not really correct, which is counterintuitive. But when we do it like this, so what people tend to do is to so this is. In the, in the classic approach, we are not fixing the ancestral components. We are not fixing the founder populations. We do not know anything of these. The only thing we end up knowing about these are the uh, allele frequencies for, for those. And those is what's, yeah. what's being estimated uh, jointly. The um, If we can do this kind of a supervised where we know, where, where we are fixating our proportions according to these uh, to, to a known reference, then it's a, it's a more simple problem. But, and if you only have one of them, I think it should be relatively simple just to let the other, the, that mixture proportion float for, for the final part. Yeah, but that's uh, if you are speaking about like global admix, uh, like mm. just components, right? But if you yeah. want to infer a local ancestry. Yeah. That, so, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's an interesting uh, analysis to do, but I think it also quickly turns very, uh, very uh, difficult to uh, to model and and, and implement. Uh, because you also need to have other information. You should also. You should also need to take into account the, the difference in local recombination if that if you have this and it's uh, I don't think it's uh, or don't you think this is needed? Well, actually, uh, I was uh, like caught on a paper where we uh, like inferred uh, archaic introgression mm. just from uh, having. Uh, modern uh, non-admixed out group. Mm. So I, I think that uh, in general with ancestry, if you have the sun admixed out group, then you can uh, infer the second component. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure if yeah. any methods like implement that. Yeah, well, I, I think it also depends on, on, the, on, on how much difference you expect from these components. True. Yeah, if you want to figure out the, um, if you want to split out an individual in a African and in a Greenlandic individual, then th there are so big difference in allele frequencies, so it's uh, relatively easy. On the other hand, uh, we had one project where we wanted to look at the admixture that we had in uh, in ancient Viking samples. So mm -hmm. this would be individuals from, from different settlements along the coast of uh, Norway. And I mean, there's so little difference between these uh, that it's going to be a much more problematic. Um, so yeah. if there's a strong signal, then I, I, it's, it's, it's easy to do. And especially with mm -hmm. acaric integration, because it's a whole new, um, it's a whole different haplotype or haplogroup. Yes. I would assume that it's going to be a, 
it should be, be doable and it shouldn't be problematic and it should also be easy to interpret, I think. But, but these things with the, with the biking uh, samples from different sediments, it, it's not easy. So even with, in the past, it's, also, I, I, it's a shame I forgot this name. There was this whole paper devoted about why, it's, um, why we should be careful about not over-interpreting uh, admixture plots. Mm. Because this, this is also what people have, have been doing in the past is that they have this kind of PCA that is that takes all the, the European populations and, and put them down. And then they, by random chance, it looks almost the same as, a, as if you had had a, a, a map of the geography of Europe. And then you can start to, to, to spin up these stories where a population travels from there and they gave rise to, to, LC, to the lactase region. And, but, but it's so distances in, in, in a standard PCA is, is not the. Uh, it's not really uh, well defined, and it's with these that mixture plot. It's also because th these are what we are plotting are these founder frequencies and founder components. Mm -hmm. uh, and there might also be an issue of um, of if you have very few individuals and and many many individuals. Say if you have a, had a hundred uh, Africans and ten uh, with Indian ancestry, then you cannot estimate the uh, frequency with uh, such a fine scale in the Indian population or the Indian subcomponents. Mm -hmm. So that will also give rise to some kind of bias. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any like rule of thumb uh, how many uh, like outgroup individuals to include? Like, let, let's say we have, uh, uh, I don't know, some, I don't know, Mexicans. Mm. And uh, you want to infer like European and uh, mm. Asian and native components. And you have like a sample of 100 Mexicans, how many uh, like, uh, yeah. uh, Europeans and Africans and Asians, would you add? No, I don't. So actually with many of these things, it's the same with, with the PCA. The PCA that you get is also very much determined on, on your reference mm -hmm. data sets. If, if, you, if you're doing a PCA and you have like these very, very far between uh, populations like Europeans, Mexicans and Africans, then you will never be able to uh, to make a proper distinction between a uh, hundred samples from a solely European context because everything would just be in the blob. So you need yep. to put in the references that kind of uh, pulls out the uh, the information. Mm -hmm. With regards to 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 these kind of, of admixture, it's what what we do in practice is that you we need to run it at least twenty times because it, it's very likely to get stuck in these uh, local, uh, localized minima and optima. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, and, and how this is done is, because it's also very computational slow. So, so not with a K of two and three and five, but what, what you should also do is to start with two and then go all the way up to, to 15. But at some point, that also the whole question that's being asked all the time, what is the optimal K to choose? And um, there are also much in literature written about how to do this and, and in what they recommend in the recent update in the admixture when you want to choose K is to do a kind of a cross validation to see uh, at some point you obtain a, like a, at some point you, you do not get more information in your, uh, by, by adding more uh, uh, founder populations, you're, you're just in, increase the, the noise. There is of course these model selections approaches like AIC and, and BIC, but, but given that, that the parameter space is uh, so extremely large and it's not really embedded the smaller ones, it's not really embedded in the larger ones. So I'm, I don't really think it's suitable, but it is, I think this uh, BIC is suitable for a situation where you are, need to choose between maybe 12 and, uh, and 16 parameters. But here we are optimizing uh, millions, 20 million parameters jointly. 
and then suddenly mm. you have a BIC of a difference between 20 and, and 30 maybe millions. So I, I don't think these are, are, are suitable. And again, you asked if there's rule of thumb. I, it's not be, because you're generating a K with with two, but three makes more sense in, in the interpretation. Does not mean a K equal two is wrong. But at some point, you are when you're when you are looking at these things, it's um, it's it's clear that you do not get more uh, information, and some population might start to split out in um, in in. In, in, in subcomponents, which, which is not really meaningful. And then you might end up with uh, what, you are, what you are analyzing is, uh, is not so much the biological aspect, but there might be some uh, idiosyncrasies in, uh, in how the data was obtained. There's actually a, a very interesting, I think it was from Matthew Stevens, where they're using this kind of ad admixture approach but they're not using it for uh, estimating uh, admixture proportion and frequencies. What they are doing is that they're using it for, uh, for uh, figuring out if there's problem with the lab work. Because if you are using different uh, library preparations and uh, different protocols and different enzymes in your, uh, in, in your lab and you start to do uh, an, an admixture style plot, then you can certainly see that the different library protocols, even though they should generate exactly the same, that there is some kind of underlying uh, signal. This is, all, it's also being used uh, uh, in, um, in cancer research. These, so I think it's, so within genetics and population genetics, we call this, uh, we call it an admixture model. It's part of a larger family of, uh, of data mining tools called the grade of membership models or, uh, or uh, and, and topic models, I think they're also called. So this is, um, it, it's being used a, a lot in, uh, in different, in, 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 not just within genetics, but in many different aspects of, of data mining. So I, I have a PhD student that, uh, came from physics. He has a physics, uh, his main supervisor is all from the physics department. And it's, it's been some very interesting uh, discussions because a lot of the stuff that I th thought was solely uh, existing within the frame of biology and, uh, and bioinformatics and populations genetics is that they, it's, they are, um, it's like a, a separate instance of a, of a problem that also exists within physics, which is part of the same underlying uh, uh, conceptual uh, model. So he implemented a version of this grade of membership or, or a mixture very fast using standard Python tools. I had to spend uh, months programming this in, uh, in C with uh, all these special maximization. So, uh, yeah, but it was before Python I, I wrote this code. So, <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you very much for the insights. Well, then I think that's it for today. And uh, yeah, we are finishing our school as well. So, <coughs> thank you very much, Torfin. And uh, well, Rasmus and Ras are not present, but. Let's thank them as well. So again, all the materials are available on YouTube and there will be a web page, uh, like summarizing all the uh, materials as well. So thank you again for teaching us Torfin and thank you everyone for participating. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.